So what we're going to do is we're going to be selective. And we're going to hit what, what I would call some of the big psalms, some of those that are really familiar, Psalm 23, some of those that are really familiar to us. We're going to touch on those. And then there's a, a few others that, that maybe you wouldn't consider would be a good contender for us to study, but um, there's a few that might surprise you that I want us to take some time uh, to look at. So we've got, what, eight, nine, ten, we've got ten weeks left, so we can cover, this is one, so we can get through eleven psalms. Um, and so um, I think that'll give us a good, ba- and we're going to hit, we're not, we're going to hit different sections of the psalms, some in the middle, some at the end, some, at, you know, at the beginning. We're going to we're going to get a, a good uh, cross section of the book. So uh, we're going to begin in Psalm one this morning. We've talked about a lot of stuff so far. This is our third lesson. We talked about an introduction uh, to the Psalms. We looked at several different things. We're, we saw that Christians are taught to use the Psalms. Ephesians five, in verse nineteen, uh, we saw who some of the authors were of the uh, Psalms, David writing the majority of the Psalms, half of the book of Psalms, David wrote 73. Uh, Hebrew, uh, New Test- uh, Hebrew Old Testament says he wrote 75, so that's 150, that's half of the book of Psalms that he wrote. Um, there are some Psalms, and this morning is one of them. Um, there are 35 Psalms that have no author, and Psalm 1 is one of those. There's no author uh, that is given to us, so we're going to to see that. Then we talked about an anatomy of a psalm that was very detailed study last week, but we talked about the ways in which a psalm is broken down. All of us can see in our Bibles that there is the main text. That is the same in our our Bibles, but there are some different ways in which the psalm begins. Some begin with a chapter heading. Some begin with a little overview. Um, They all begin with what's called a superscription. That's a little thing, author David, uh, to the choir master, this. Those are called superscriptions. Uh, While not part of the original text, well, the Hebrew Bible considers them part of the original text. While not part of the original uh, text, they are included um, in every translation of, of uh, of the New Testament. Of course, it's coming from the Septuagint, and the Septuagint included these superscriptions. And they're usually in a different font. So you can tell what those are at the beginning of your psalm. They're usually in a different font. So we talked about kind of how a psalm is uh, broken down, how we can look at it, and how we can uh, read it. Uh, This morning we're looking at Psalm 1. I give you on your outline some uh, things for us to consider as we get started. Um, One of the things that I, I like, somebody told me this years ago, every journey begins with the first step. This is our first step. We are, we are on our journey to, to work our way through the book of Psalms, so we're beginning that today. Um, this is a quote from Burton Kaufman, uh, a, a, a brotherhood preacher and teacher. He said, and I, and I like this quote, he said, From Genesis to Revelation, the Holy Bible recognizes only two classes of people. The same two classes that are identified in this psalm, Psalm 1. That is, the servants of God and the enemies of God. That, that's all you get to see. Uh, today, that classification, there are those who are Christian, there are those who are not Christian. There's no kind of sort of maybe I'm in between. You're either a Christian or you're not a Christian. There's, well, I'm thinking about it. Well, good, think about it, but that doesn't, thinking about it doesn't make you a Christian. So there are two groups of individuals. There are the saved and there are the lost. These Psalms deal with those two categories. They deal with those two categories. Now, they talk about those who are lost and the condition that they are living under and the things that they can suffer. They talk about the saved and the blessings that they have. But they also give warnings to the saved and how they need to remain uh, faithful. But it's only two groups of people that are being discussed in the Psalms. Okay? Uh, The Psalms serve as a suitable, this Psalm serves as a suitable introduction to the rest of the book. Um, It's just, the way it's formatted and the way it comes, it, it really does give us a good structure of what we're going to see in the book of Psalms. Now, we haven't read this psalm yet, but if you go down to Psalm 1 and verse 6, um, really it gives you a, a good understanding of what the psalm is going to be about. I would say it this way, Psalm 6 is a synopsis of verses 1 through 5. And uh, the psalmist kind of ends with recapping the things that he mentions in this psalm. And he says in verse 6, For the Lord 
uh, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. That is at the heart of Psalm 1, that understanding. And so we go into this psalm with the understanding that, one, God wants us to be a faithful people. That's what God does. Now, we, we have a choice whether or not we're going to be faithful. I understand that. It's free will. We can choose to or choose not to serve God. The, the, the perspective of God is that he wants man to be faithful. God desires all men to be saved, we're told in the New Testament. So going in, we understand that. But the truth of the matter is, there are some who refuse or those who simply choose not to um, believe that God is God. And that as God, He has set for us those things that ought to be done as we live. And, and, and so we, we see this come to uh, fruition in our life. I don't want us to begin with the understanding that God is setting things up against us. God makes it as easy as he possibly can for us to be a people who not only understand who he is. I mean, he's revealed who he is. This omnipotent God has revealed to a fallible, sinful creation himself. Makes himself known to us. Um, not only do the Psalms do that, they make God known to us, but they make ourselves, this sounds odd, <laughs> they, make our, they make us known to ourselves. Introspection. They make us look inward and say, is this me? Is, is this what I'm doing? Much, much like the book of Proverbs. And so we want to look for those types of things, who God is and who we are as a people of faith. So let's just get into it. Um, we'll, we'll read a section, then we'll come back and we'll break it down and work our way through it. Here's the first one, Psalm 1, the righteous and the wicked contrasted. Verses 1 through 3, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, this man, blessed is the man who walks, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So the first three verses give us just in themselves a, a, a contrast. And these are broken down on, on your outline for you. So the first three verses give us the contrast. The first thing that we see is the character of this man. Blessed is the man. So we get a glimpse of what type of character the man that's being discussed in Psalm 1 has. It's written about this individual. It talks about the blessings that come from God, but it's not a psalm written about what God is and who God does and why. It's written about a man. This is a fallible man. This is a man like you and I, okay? This is a man who has struggles and victories just like you and I. It's written about this blessed man, okay? And so we get a look at his, his character. First, it's described from um, what I suggested to you there are, are negative, a negative point of view. Okay, it's character. What does he do? What does he not do? He doesn't walk in the way of the counsel of the ungodly. He's a godly man. He doesn't seek understanding from those who are not in a right relationship with God. Now, certainly, we can see an application of that to us today. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33. Surely we can see an application how it would be wise for us to seek counsel, not from those who have rejected God, but from those who have accepted God and become Christians. So we're right there with this man in Psalm 1. And what does he do? He doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. The second thing he doesn't do, nor stand in the path of sinners. He keeps himself from evil. He doesn't stand in the path of those who are walking in the way. A path, you walk, you travel down a path. A path is a direction. It's somewhere you're going. Okay? He's not standing still. 
He's living his life. He's walking down this path. But this man, this man who is wise, doesn't stand in the path. He doesn't go in the way that other sinners are going. He understands that there's a way to live and a way not to live. And of those who are going down that path of sinners, he says, I'm I'm not going to do that. Um, He keeps himself from evil. Yeah, yeah. So that's the thing. The third negative is this. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. He is not among those who are mocking in their nature to God. Uh, The scornful. Uh, He is not going to be one who participates in those things that are... um, What's the best way to say it? Um, uh, Those things that... that, uh, are un- ungodly, those things that um, belittle God, um, those things that are contrary to the nature of God. I'll, I'll suggest to you that last point has its focus on who God is. The seat of the scornful is certainly not those who are praising God. We already saw the path that they're walking. They're walking, they're living in the way of sinners. Well, you don't expect these people who are walking on this path to be individuals who stop and say, Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. This man, verse 1, is blessed because he says, I'm not going to participate in that. I'm not going to do that. Now, there's a lesson there for us. Because if we're not cautious, we tend to intermix with those who are scornful. I think there's a way to evangelize, absolutely. But I think there is a wise way to evangelize. I'm not going to go down to the dance club and pass out my business cards in the middle of the dance club. Those people need to be reached, but not with me participating in what they're doing wrong. There's a way. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's a progression. It's a progression. Um, uh, you you kind of see, and oh boy, I heard a great sermon on this just a, about a month or so ago. I can't remember the guy's name. I do remember he was handsome as can be. Um, Oh, yeah, it was me. Um, and we talked about the progression of, of sin. We talked about, uh, it was the, in the life of David, how he uh, lusted after Bathsheba, how he committed adultery with Bathsheba, how he um, committed uh, murder uh, to hide his relationship with Bathsheba. That progression, that progression. So you, you begin to see kind of this, this negative point of view, these things. But then you begin to see this, this, this blessed man. You begin to see um, a positive perspective of the things that he does. And, and remember what I told you? This is often a comparison and a contrast. So we're seeing one way and then the other way. So the next thing that it says, but his verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and day. And night. This is a committed man. Okay? This is a committed man. He has a right relationship with the law of God. He meditates on it. We need to be a people of the book. We need to meditate on the law of God, on the words of God, on the commands of God, on the love of God. We need to be a people who have that type of determination. Am I thinking about God's word? Right? This man is meditating upon these things. Uh, In God's law, he meditates day and night. It is part of who he is. It's become him day and night. It's something that he does. It becomes that quality of what his life is. I always talk about attributes, qualities and characteristics. I always talk about that because attributes describe things. You and I, well, we have several attributes in common, we two arms, two legs, two eyes, you know, we have, you know, several things. But what one thing that I know we all have in common is we have the attribute of eating. Everybody in here eats. Every single one of us. Eating is an attribute of who we are. This is an attribute, attribute, meditating upon the the, the law of, of, of God is an attribute. It describes who he is. It doesn't describe what he gets around to when he has the time. 
look closely, but his delight, he enjoys doing this, verse 2, his delight, he's not frustrated about it, he's not annoyed by it, he's not frustrated about it, but his delight, I think, I don't know if it's King James or one of them, maybe NASB says joy, I think, but his joy, uh, but his, same, same word, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. I like it. I like it. Make a comparison. I delight in baseball. I take joy in baseball. And because it's something that I delight in, because it's something that brings me joy, I engage in it as much as I possibly can. It's a delight to me. This man makes the Word of God part of who he is, and he enjoys doing it. Okay? He enjoys doing it. I think that should be our attitude when it comes to worship. 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 Our He shall be like, thank you very much. Verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now we've got verses 4 through 6 to go through yet, but we already see what maybe is a good ending in verse 3. Verse 3 gives us a glimpse of the result of this man being who he is. Okay? It gives us a result of this man being who... There, there is... Um, um, there's an outcome. There's an outcome that we have regarding the type of people that we are. Now, if that outcome can go two ways. It can be a good outcome... You know, where we benefit, where we're blessed. Um, it could be a bad, bad outcome. If verse 3 sounds a little familiar, think of in the New Testament, a man reaps what he sows. Look at what this man sowed. He sowed a godly relationship with God. He sowed a relationship when he said, it is a joy to me to think about the word of God. Think about who this man was. I'm not going to live the way sinners live. Right? I'm not going to be those who are like the scornful. I'm not going to do... They're not going to be part of my character of who I am. Well, there's an end result to that type of living. Verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He's firm and he's alive. A tree planted by water. He's alive. In West Texas, where I'm from, not a lot of water. Not a lot of water. And what little water there is, it, this life just gravitates towards it. And you can sit on a landscape, and you can look out over that landscape, and you can, you can tell where there's water. You can tell where there's not water. You can look and you can tell where there's water because there's going to be a green spot. There's going to be a green spot. Now, maybe that water is underground and it's coming from the Edwards Aquifer. And those trees and those plants have gotten down where they're getting some of that moisture. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's a shallowness, a dent. 
And when it rains, water pools there, whatever it can be. Maybe there's a spring. Maybe there is water running there. Whatever it may be, you can look and you can see, wait a minute, there's a difference here between over there. I can, I can see a difference. Here's life. Things are living. Here, things are barely getting by. Right? They're, they're barely doing it. This isn't a man who's barely getting by. You see? Uh, this is a man who's like these, these rivers of water. Okay? And so he's a man uh, that is alive. He's a man uh, that is planted uh, firmly. And then the next thing you see, and I, I mentioned this on your outline, is you see the manifest, manifestations of his prosperity. Because he's firm, because he's like this tree that's planted by water, he produces fruit. Okay? He produces fruit. He is like a growing tree. A uh, fruit tree that brings forth its fruit in its season. It's not dead. It's alive. It's not barren. It's producing fruit. So w what would be the application to us? Are we planted near the water? Are we, are we alive? Are, are, are we, are we uh, fruitful? Are we producing things? Or have we become barren? Where, where are we as a people of faith? Well, we all want to be the tree planted by the water. I never met anybody who said, oh, I want to be withered and non-fruit bearing. I, I've, I've never, does, does it happen? Yes, it happens. But I've never met anybody who said, that's my goal. Let me be barren. We want what the blessed man, verse 1, blessed is the man, whoever this man may be. I think it's all of us, should be all of us. We should all be the man. And I think because of where his relationship is with God, he's going to produce those things that are going to be uh, good, that brings forth its fruit in its seasons, in its time. Fruit takes time to grow. I think one of the struggles that we have is we don't see fruit immediately and we get discouraged. Um, I learned something about, about lemon trees when, when um, we were preaching the gospel out in California. I learned, do you know when a lemon is ripe? Have you ever seen a lemon tree? Yeah. Do you know when a lemon is ready to be picked? This is interesting. It's a trick question. Whenever you want to pick it. A lemon is a lemon from the time it's a little bitty bud. It tastes like a lemon. If you cut that little bud open, it looks like a lemon. It's just a tiny little lemon. It's ready to go. It's ready to go. When we begin to produce our fruit, we should be ready to go. We should be ready. The fruit is there. It's produced. We need to take advantage of that. But fr fruit takes time um, to grow. You don't plant an apple tree on Monday and get apples on Tuesday. Now, sometimes you can plant the gospel on Monday... I've studied with people. You can reap a Christian on Tuesday. I've seen that. But it's kind of like Paul says, you know, I planted, Apollos watered. I mean, you plant that seed and you don't know when that gospel seed is going to produce the fruit of a Christian. You watch it. Sure, I like that analogy. Um, you you see the the parable of the soil, you know, um, kind of what Sister Jean said. I mean, you're around these people who are ungodly, and what do you do when you have opportunity? You you plant the seed, right? You you, you do the best you can. Does it mean you see the fruit the very the very next day, it's kind of what you know how you know how a seed knows how to grow. This is, I mean, some of you, this is, you know, biology one hundred one. Um, 
you can take a, a, a healthy, good corn seed and you can throw it in the ground on January 1st and it won't grow. And you're thinking, how in the world does that seed know it's January? How does it, and it's like when Alicia and I get in this argument all the time. Her medicine says, take at night. And I'm like, how does that pill know it's 9 o'clock at night as opposed to 9 o'clock in the morning? How does that pill know? Well, that pill knows because it's time released, and it releases a certain amount of that medicine over a specific period of time. If you want the benefits of that pill that is supposed to be taken at night so it has that extended release that gives you the benefits through the whole day, then you take it at night. If you take it in the morning, you don't get the benefits of that extended release. Okay, a seed knows how to grow because of temperature. Because of the quality of the soil. The seed, the seed knows this. It won't grow in minus 30 degrees below zero, however cold that ground is. But it'll grow if it's 75 degrees. And if the soil's right, that seed won't grow if it's 75 degrees and the soil hasn't been fertilized, hasn't been aerated, hasn't been tilled, you know, hasn't been properly prepared. It can be the right temperature, but it's the wrong soil. Isn't that what we deal with all the time? That's what Gene is talking about. Isn't that what we deal with all the time? Helping people to get their soil right. And sometimes you plant that seed and it doesn't grow in an individual's life because one, it's too cold. At that point, they ain't interested in what you're saying. You, true. True. And so it, it takes this time to produce this fruit. I, I'll, to, to bring it back to this psalm, I, I think this blessed man is a patient man. He's a patient man, and he, he waits for that season when through his godly living, living, that something will, that fruit will be produced. He's patient. He endures. He hangs in there. Sometimes we quit right at, I saw a, a little a picture. It was on um, uh, uh, Facebook, and it was, uh, the person was po posting about encouragement, don't give up, and had this, this man, and he was digging under the ground. Maybe you saw it. He was digging and digging and digging under the ground, and he was digging and digging, and you look, and he's got this long, huge tunnel that he's done under the ground, and eventually he says, that's it, I quit, but just a few strokes more, and he would have hit a gold mine. Sometimes that's like us. Who knows what we would have hit with a few more strokes? Paul said, be steadfast and movable. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor is not in vain. So we're patient, and we chip away, and we chip away, and we chip away. Listen, I've preached the gospel to people 25 years ago who are not Christians today. But I'm not going to quit, right? I'm not going to quit. So this man is patient, and he understands that in due season, verse 3, brings forth its fruit in its season. And then he goes on and says this, Whose leaf shall not wither, his good works won't cease. He's firmly planted, he's got this water source, he's got the Word of God, he's got all those things that are going for him. And, and he's not going to wither away. This is a Christian that is living and faithful and act, We are a Christian that's living and faithful and active. This is a man who's manifesting those same things. He's living, he's faithful, he's active. Because of how he's planted. Okay? Many of us dry up because we separate ourselves from that life-giving uh, stream of God's Word. And I get people all the time who will say to me, and it's a very simple answer, who will say to me, I just don't know why my faith isn't strong. I just don't feel that my strength, my faith is growing. I feel that my faith is weak. What do I need to do? You know, how much Bible reading do you do? The more time you spend in Scripture, the stronger your faith is going to be. Romans 10 and verse 17. That's right. That's right. Yes. Right. 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 
Yeah. It takes time. It takes time. Right. When somebody asked me on when I was riding on a bus in downtown San Antonio, saw me reading the Bible, mind you, with my backpack open and the Bible hidden inside of it. I didn't want people to see me that I was reading the Bible. You know, I wasn't a Christian. And some guy says to me, hey, do you want to study the Bible? That was a member of the church. And he planted a seed. I didn't become a Christian the next day. I studied with him. Well, he studied with me. And it produced fruit. So we see this thing. His good works will not cease. And then he's blessed and whatever he does shall prosper. Now, it doesn't always, pro it's like the fruit. It doesn't always prosper at the rate we want it to prosper. But, but prosperity is what the end result is. But, but notice in verses 2 through 3 that the conditions are right. The conditions are right. Okay, We need to produce those right conditions in who we are. Uh, verses 4 through 5 says this, The ungodly are not so. So here's, we've looked at the, the blessed man. We've looked at his characteristics. We've seen what type of person he is. And now we're moving on. Okay, now we're moving on. And he says, the ungodly are not so. Not so what? Not so uh, bearing its fruit in season, uh, firmly planted uh, by, by good water, uh, one who delights in the law of the Lord and knows God's word. But the negative man, the ungodly man, is not so. He's the contrast of the godly man. Okay, The ungodly are not so but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And I give you some suggestions there on your outline, some uh, ideas of what this could mean. Verse 4, um, the, uh, the ungodly are not so. They're not like, not, uh, they're, they're not like the godly. Uh, they're like chaff which the wind drives away. That's kind of... Uh, Metaphor that loses a little bit of understanding as our uh, as we get older as a nation and we move from agriculture to industrial, we move from farming to making computer chips and working in in offices. But people used to understand how you got rid of the chaff. You would throw it uh, up in, up in the air, and the, it's light, and the wind would carry it away, and you you'd get that pure product. We kind of lose some of that today because most of us have never done that. Okay, we've, we've never separated that. We've never done that. And, and so um, here you see that there is a difference. They are like chaff, which the wind drives away. They don't, they're not firmly planted. They're not strong. They're not fixed. The wind, anything in life, anything that comes along, the wind just drives them away. Okay? They, they have nothing to help keep them settled, nothing to help keep them, them firm. Their, their condition in verse 4 um, is, is dangerous. Is, is dangerous. Okay. Verse 5, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, one, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, two. And, and what I have on your, your outline there is their sorry end. Um, the, the verse 5 isn't talking about midlife. Okay? So if you want to know what the end result is of somebody who doesn't live like the blessed man, okay, if you want to know ultimately what the end result is of a person like that, or if you want to know ultimately what the end result is of one who, who is not firmly planted, all those things, one who um, is like that chaff, the end result is, first of all, they don't, that, that the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. They'll be lost. They'll be hopeless. They'll be separated from God. Judgment will find them guilty. What a terrible future. What a terrible future. To have at the very end, God not say, enter in well and good and faithful servant, but God to say, away from me, 
You practice iniquity. Go away. I don't want you in my presence. What a terrible end. On the day of judgment, they can't stand. Um, the interesting thing there that we sometimes lose, the victor stands. The victor always stands. They're not victorious, so they can't stand in the presence. It's a metaphor. They can't stand in the presence of God. Okay? So right there you see that the result isn't good. The second thing is, sinners shall not stand in the congregation of the righteous. Um, in judgment, there will be a separation between the godly and the unrighteous. So understand, and you hear me say this all the time, there's no second chance at the second coming. There's no second chance at the judgment. Right? They won't stand in the congregation. They won't stand with the righteous. They're not going to be intermixed. They're not going to squeak by. They're not going to, you know, kind of fool their way in. No, there's there's going to be this division. Just like the parable of the sheep and the goats. Separate it left and right. Okay. Depart from me, I never knew you. So there, there is going to be this in judgment, this, um, this separation. It kind of speaks to those who say, well, eventually everybody will be saved. Universalists. Um, I listened to this guy <laughs> preach. I was listening to him yesterday. It drives you crazy. Um, this preacher guy comes on and, and uh, uh, makes me mad, and I get frustrated, and I throw the phone at Alicia. But um, um, I just, I, I, it's, it's, it's like a train wreck. I just can't look away. Um, and he's a universalist, and he believes that ultimately, kind of like the concept of purgatory with the Catholics. You may have to suffer a little bit when you die in purgatory, but eventually you'll go to heaven. And so universalists believe that ultimately everybody's going to be saved. Here's a nail in the coffin of universalism. God himself is saying that there's going to be a separation and sinners in the congregation of the righteous will not have that opportunity to stand with them, to be found faithful. Okay? So there's a consequence for how we live. And then the last thing that I gave you there in verse 6 where we began, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Again, it's the final contrast between these two things. The, the psalmist is driving home a point. He knows you read the, the, the previous uh, uh, verses. He, he understands that you know he's worked its way through it. He gets it, but it's that final admonishment. If, if those things weren't enough, he's essentially saying, Re remember, 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 you know, maybe we'd say, you, look, you can count on this, you can bank on this, right? Re remember um, that there's a destination for the righteous, and God knows their way. Even though they may suffer persecution, even though they may go through a hard, uh, hard times, God knows the way of the righteous. And the second thing is true, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Uh, if there's a sad verse in this psalm, surely it's the second part of verse 6. Eternal separation from God for the ungodly. You know, I'll say it again where I began. I don't think anybody begins out saying, yeah, I, hey, what do I want? I want to perish in, in hell for eternity. That's, that's, I want good things to happen to me. I, I want good things to happen to those that I love and those things of that nature. It's a, it's a comparison and a contrast that, that gets our attention. And, and, and what I said before, you see this pattern, what you have here in, in, in Psalm 1, you see this pattern continually repeat. Now, there are psalms of praise where the focus is just praising God. Remember I told you there's psalms of lament, uh, psalms of praise, you know, all these different, uh, different things. Um, and, and so there are certainly psalms where the focus is just on God. But you see this pattern. Time and time again in the book of Psalms, where this contradiction is being made between the righteous and the ungodly. Same comparison that you see in the New Testament. Okay? Same comparison that you see in the New Testament. So it's, it's not something new that God has brought about during the time of Christ. It's something that God has always done. Any questions or comments? Yes, Joe.
Yeah, true. Kind of, again, kind of what Gene is saying. You got to intermix with those who are lost. You know, it's what we do. We come across them in our daily life. All. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, have a prayer. Father, we thank you for this time of study that's been ours, that we can look into your word, that we can, Father, understand it, and we can make application to our lives. Father.